I'm Barry Fosher. I'm the author of The Rough Guide to Crime Fiction and a new book called Brit Noir, which features this gentleman, James Oswald, who is a remarkable writer. In a fairly short space of time, he's become a kind of must-read writer for those who want gritty, tough, well-written crime fiction. This is the Inspector McLean series, which is set in Edinburgh. They're very dark books. And I'm pleased to say I have James with me here. Thank you for coming, James. Thank you. Thank you for coming. So it's an interesting career you've got. You've, for a start, you've got an interesting career trajectory. You are from, I think uh, I was told that you are Fife Farmer to Festival Headliner. That's a nice way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> I am a Fife Farmer, that's true, yes. Um, still? Still. Okay. Just, just hanging on there. So which is the day job, the, the farming or the writing? It's a mixture of the two. I mean, farming is, because I'm a livestock farmer, so um, I'm not farming nine to five every day. There's times when I am, like the day before yesterday, we sheared the lambs, so that took all day. I didn't do any writing work at all. Um, but there's times where all I have to do is go and check the livestock all the right way up, and then I can come home and, and write during the day. But mostly I, I tend to do the farm work in the day and then write in the evenings. So as well as writing this extremely well-written fiction, you've done things like you are, and I'm going to give the polite version of this, a professional sheep feces sampler. Well, I'm not a professional sheep That's not feces. as alliterative as it could have been. No, I think, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm not a professional sheep feces sampler anymore. It was a, a, an interesting job that I had uh, a few years back when I, I was working down in Wales as an agricultural research consultant. And there was a project down there to study the effect of worming treatments on, on the Welsh sheep flock. And I got to drive around the Welsh countryside visiting a number of farms over the summer, basically picking up samples of sheep poo off the field. Um, we knew where, which flock of sheep they'd come from and when they'd been dosed with what particular drug. And the, you do a, a, they call a faecal egg count um, <laughs> test, where you basically look at it under a microscope and count the number of parasites and from that you can see whether the drugs are working or not. So while you're examining sheep feces, are you thinking Detective Inspector McLean, now what can I have him do tonight? Are you incubating in your mind those books that you're about to write? Um, I think when I was doing that I was probably more thinking about um, dragons and magic but, uh -huh. but yes, I mean wandering around the farm, driving a tractor backwards and forwards up and down a field when you're trying to cut hay or whatever, uh, it's a great time to let the mind wander. In fact, we should touch on the fact that you are also, in another secret identity, J.D. Oswald. Yeah, it's a, it's a well-hidden secret <laughs> identity, that, yes. So do the people who read your James Oswald books know about your J.D. Oswald books? They do, funnily enough. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not an obvious crossover, crime fiction to epic fantasy, but I'm really pleased. I see on Amazon reviews, mostly, is where I get most of my feedback, and I think most writers do. But you see reviews where people give, a, give the fantasy book five stars and say, I don't normally read this, but I liked his crime books, and I love this. And the other way around, you get people... So it who, does cut both ways. Yeah, it does cut both ways. That's good yeah. to hear. So Tony McLean, very distinctive character, but when you introduced him, you introduced him into an overcrowded field where there's an awful lot of tough, dyspeptic Edinburgh coppers. Well, um, when I wrote the books, it was perhaps a little bit presumptuous because that was a lot later. But when I first came up with the character, um, yes, I don't think there were more than two or three Rebus books out. Um, so Edinburgh wasn't quite so packed with detectives then. Right. Um, but that was, a, that was a comic script and he was a, a support character. It was basically a ghost story uh, and he was the policeman who could see, sort of see the ghosts that were doing all the mischief in the background. Um, it wasn't until much, much later um, that I, when I turned to writing crime fiction, um, on the advice of my good friend Stuart McBride, mm -hmm. who I also met in Aberdeen back then, um, and when he got his big break with Cold Granite, his first book, and he said to me, stop writing these stupid dragon fantasy books, crime fiction's where it's at, where it's at. So I thought, well, I've got this character and he's popped up from time to time in books, maybe I'll give him centre stage. And I, I wrote a half dozen short stories just to try and see what, whether I could do anything with him. Um, that was probably about 2005. Uh, so that's where he first started to become a, you know, his, own, his own character. Well, he's very different from Rebus, but the main difference is in the books. These are very dark, mesmerizing thrillers 
with very much their own identity and also a sense around the edges unlike Rebus of the supernatural. Mm. That's very de deliberate and it goes back to, to the comics origin really of the character. I'd, I'd love the idea of you take a sort of a perfectly contemporary standard police um, situation and then you throw into the mix a, you know, a satanic ritual and then think well what actually if the demon that they were trying to raise did exist how is the policeman going to cope with that um, particularly a policeman who's a rationalist and an atheist and doesn't believe in any of that stuff but is constantly faced up with that, that, that old Sherlock Holmes thing you know once you've eliminated the impossible um, and, 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 and he has to come to the, the conclusion that there's something in it and then try and work out how to deal with it. What's interesting about the Tony McLean books is this what is at the edges, which we talked about, the supernatural and the horrific. But he is a rationalist. Um, is there ever any sense that you really want to do a full-blown supernatural series, which this isn't, really? Uh, well, I started off, the, the original version of Natural Causes was very definitely full-blown supernatural stuff. And I couldn't get a publisher for the life of me. And, I, and then I wrote, I'd written the sequel to it, The Book of Souls, which was even more... Um, the, the original ending of the Book of Souls, there was no doubt about what was going on. And, and everyone, you know, and still couldn't get a publisher for it, it was shortlisted for the debut dagger. The first two were both shortlisted. Uh, but publishers just looked at them, ah, supernatural crime, no market for that. And so I, I rewrote the Book of Souls completely and took all of the supernatural out of it. And I hated it, it was kind of flat and dead. Um, so then I thought, well, well just, just put in a hint of it and, and leave the question hanging at the end. Mm. You know, was there something in it or was he just suffering from oxygen starvation um, on account of being stuck in a fire? But uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I like sort of playing around and leaving hints and, and stuff rather so than... You're not alone because Sharon Bolton, S.J. Bolton's mm. book, originally was a full-blown horror novel mm. with supernatural elements which were taken out. Mm. But one thing that's not really taken out is, is the darkness of the books. And you mentioned uh, Stuart McBride, who is a, a friend and a mentor. Yes, I think that's probably fair enough to say. Yeah, I mean, we, we his met, books are yeah. pretty bloody. His, he, yes, oh, that's a good way of putting it. I remember um, he, he used to send me um, sort of first uh, an early drafts and I'd give him critiques and he'd do the same for my books. And I remember reading, um, which one is it, uh, Flesh House. Uh, title says it all. Title. It was originally called the Flesher, um, <laughs> uh, but because that's what they call um, the, the, you know, the, 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 the abattoir workers, mm. the Fleshers. Uh, and I, re I remember reading a, a, there's one particular scene in it. I um, won't give away too much, and having to put it down and go outside and have a breath of fresh air. Because and actually, when I went back to read it again, it wasn't anything like as horrific. It's just the way he'd suggested things happening and you left it to you to make you know to paint the picture yourself but he'd done it so well well you generously ascribe that to Stuart mm -hmm. but you have been guilty if that's the word of exactly the same scenario so natural causes correct me if I'm wrong originally had an extremely gruesome but fairly short opening yeah that upset a lot of readers it did yes uh, I, I was kind of 50 50 split on the feedback from the early self-published version of it which had that opening chapter uh, on people saying, I, 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 I put down the book, I couldn't read it after the first, the first thing. And it's, it is short, it's 500 words. Mm. Uh, it's a description of a gang rape and murder of a woman from the point of view of the victim. Um, and it doesn't really pull any punches. It has a fantastic final line, which yeah. I can't quite remember. I think it's... Um, she then, her death... Came. It's about the death of the character. Yeah, she dies, but she didn't. She, but yeah. But, but even then, she wasn't. She takes a long time to die. But even then, she's not in, at peace. So uh, I believe the new Penguin edition now includes that chapter as yes. an appendix. We, we we took it out and put it as a, as appendix um, because it's 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 of a different tone to the rest of the book, really. And the the reason that I put that in was goes back to the debut dagger. I, I put Natural Causes in for the debut dagger in two thousand and six, two thousand and seven, I think it was, and. I wanted something to grab the judges because you only get the first three chapters and a synopsis. Uh, and, and the original opening is the opening as you have it now, where he's just walking up the street and stumbles across a crime scene that some, another uh, officer is investigating and sticks his nose in because it's his neighbourhood. Uh, and it's not very gripping, it's a nice, gentle opening, 
there's a, a slightly visceral scene towards the end mm. of that, but um, I wanted something which would actually grab the judges by the throat and, and shake them around a bit. So I thought, well, the main investigation in this book is around this body that they find of this girl who's been murdered 60, 70 years earlier and walled up in the basement of an old Edinburgh mansion. And uh, so how she died, why, why mm. she died, it was this ritual that they were, they were performing. And, um, well, let's write the ritual. And I started writing the ritual, and then I thought, no, this is too long-winded and it's not working. And then suddenly hit on the idea to do it from the point of view of her, frightened mm. young woman. Being crucified. Basically being crucified, mm. and, yeah, and, and it's not very nice. <laughs> and I don't know what I was thinking when I wrote it. But. What makes your work fairly unique, I can't think of anyone else who does quite what you do, which is, as we said before, what's at the edges of the narrative. Mm. So, for instance, this is about an ancient ritual but you're never quite sure whether or not the supernatural world exists mm. in this book or not. It is, yeah, well, as I said, again, orig originally started off, it was very definitely, and the idea was that the, there was this ritual, they raised the demon and trapped it in the body, and whilst it was trapped in the body, they, they were immortal, um, and, and then it escaped at the end and started coming for, you know, coming for them and killing them in horrible ways, which is fairly standard horror fare. Um, but then it was sort of getting away from it being straightforward and then sort of thinking, well, what if they just thought that they'd raised a demon? And you know, the sort of people who could do that to a woman and believe that they, would, they were imbued with special powers would be extraordinary people. I mean, they'd be sick psychopaths, but they would be successful men as well. Uh, so it's not surprising that then 60 years later that those of them who are still alive are captains of industry and successful bankers and mm. things like that. Uh, so it's always playing with the, with the expectations. There's always a possible, if slightly unlikely, rational explanation. And the irrational is, is more acceptable. Mm. And that's the, the conflict that Tony McLean then has to deal with. Despite your impeccable English RP accent, you're actually a Scot. I, I'm, I'm kind of a, of mixed, mixed heritage. I mean, I, 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 I'm from a Scottish family and I've lived most of my life in Scotland, but I, I was brought up just outside Bishop Stortford, mm -hmm. um, which is not in Scotland, no. as most people will know. <laughs> so you now live in, in Fife? I live in Fife, yes. In, in a caravan? At the moment in a caravan. Um, I'm only living in a caravan because I, I took over the farm when my parents died about, was about eight years ago now. Um, I, I moved up to the farm to take over about five years ago, but my brother, my younger brother, got the house and I got the farm, um, mm. which is all perfectly Are you amicable. happy with that? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, all, it was all, all very amicable. Did your parents but, die suddenly? They did. Very, very tragically, they died in a car accident. Oh, did they? So they died um, yeah, together? They died together. So you were suddenly presented with the idea of being a farmer or you had some experience? I, I'd always intended, to, I, when, when they died, I was working down in Wales as, as an agricultural consultant. Um, sampling um, cheap feces um, and I'd always intended coming back and taking over the farm when my dad retired uh, it just happened a little bit sooner than, and, and more suddenly than anticipated but at that time were you already writing things like 2000 AD yes uh, I, I mean I've been writing well my 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 one and only um, story published by 2000 AD was published in 1993 mm -hmm. so um, yeah I've been writing for a very long time um, so how do you keep these various literary identities separate? The, the, the books about Sir Benfro, is it? The, the dragon? Sir Benfro, yes. And um, um, very tough, dark books about an Edinburgh copper. I do don't, you, do I, you still do the comics work? I, I haven't done any. I'd love, to, I'd love to get back into comics, but I'm you know, looking for the time. Uh, um, I, I don't really try to keep them terribly separate. Um, I mean, uh, apart from you know, when I'm writing, a McLean scene. I'm obviously not setting it in a forest with dragons and magic and stuff. And there aren't any policemen in the Benfro series. Uh, but it, I just, I don't find it that difficult to kind of split the two. It, in some ways, it helps actually, because if I've been slogging away at, at a, an Inspector McLean book, mm. and I'm, I'm really sick of Edinburgh and dead people, <laughs> and I can just write some fantasy, and it's wonderful to be able to do both. Uh, P.D. James used to say that she was very hard on her copper, Dalgleish, she gave him a very unhappy life over a long series of books. But I don't see how you could do anything else with Tony McLean. He's a fairly it's, tragic figure. He is a tragic figure. His, he, he, um, he was, he, his parents died um, in, a, in an air crash when he was about four. He was raised by his, his grandmother. Um, and 
the big tragedy in his life, um, which occurred to me whilst I was writing Natural Causes and then became the sort of central theme for the second book, was that his, um, his fiancée was abducted and murdered mm. um, just before they were That's a married. theme in the second book? That's, the, that, that's basically the running theme for the right. second book, because the person who did that, who Tony McLean caught ten years earlier, um, is, uh, is in jail, and he gets, he gets knifed in jail and, and, and is dead. And then as soon as he dies, the killings start up again, and there's mm. all sorts of questions as to whether they put the right person away, or whether there's a copycat, or, or whether, in fact, as the guy claimed at the time, his soul was possessed by this demonic book, and the book has resurfaced and claimed somebody else's soul. Um, and that's... Um, it, it, it's slightly, slightly embarrassing, um, having come up with it, what I thought was this brilliant idea for this central tragedy for, for Tony McLean, and, and written this book all about it. And then a couple of years later, um, Stuart McBride's um, Half Head, which is his mm. dystopian sort of near future thriller, which I'd read many, many years before in, 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 in manuscript form, um, was published. And I picked up the paperback and, and, and read, read it. And of course, his detective in there, his wife had been abducted and murdered by a serial killer. And is it the fact that there's really any 10 plots? Is it so? Yes. There's bound to be a recurrence. Yeah, exactly. I had, to, I had to email him and say, I'm really sorry, Stuart. I stole <laughs> that completely un unknowing. So there are now four books in the Tony McLean series. Five. Five. The and the Prayer for the Dead is, is number five. Is number five. And I'm working on number six at the okay. moment. So did you have, like writers like um, Shobhan Avala, the Swedish writers, mm designed ten books mentally which they then wrote and stopped. Mm, Stieg yeah. Larsson wrote three. Have you got mm. that kind of a game plan in mind? No, I'm not that organised. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it, it's the same the way I write a book as well, just a single book, let alone a series. I've come up with a, a basic idea. I mean, for this one, Prayer for the Dead, where there's a, a beginning, they find the body of a dead journalist in these caves underneath um, Gilmerton High Street. And, Literally, I, I, I found out about that place. It's a place that actually exists, Gilmerton mm. Cove in Edinburgh. And it just struck me as a wonderful setting. I didn't know what the story was going to be, but I knew there was going to be a setting in Gilmerton Cove and they were going to find a dead body. Mm. And then I had to start thinking, well, who is the dead person? How have they found him? I started off writing it as a lock room mystery. And then I gave that up because it was going to give things away too quickly. Mm. And, um, and that's, I, so when I started, I had no idea how it was going to end. And it's the same with the series. I start the, you know, I never really thought that it would be a series. Particularly, I wrote a half a dozen short stories, one of which was Natural Causes, and I expanded that into mm. a novel. Mm. And then, writing Natural Causes, I suddenly came up with this brilliant idea for a second book, um, and that that's kind of how it's evolved. So you mentioned Stuart McBride. Am I right in thinking in your literary DNA? Thomas Harris might be in there as well. I've actually never read any Thomas uh -huh. Harris. I, I, I'm actually very, very poorly read in... in <laughs> I don't believe in that. In I, it's, it's true. I mean, I've read, um, I've read all of Stuart's books, obviously, because he, sends, he used to send me manuscripts, and, and he's my friend, and I pick them up. I've read... I haven't even read all of the Rebus books. I've read a, a, a lot of them because my dad was a big fan, and I used to nick them off him when he'd finished. I've read, you know, Agatha Christie and Sherlock Holmes when I was a teenager. Um, and the other books that I've, I've read the whole, the whole lot of are the Frost books mm -hmm. and R.D. Wingfield books. But other than that... You know, I, but I, you might be said to be a, one of the children of Thomas Harris, because mm -hmm. he took the crime genre mm -hmm. and turned it into something much darker and more horrific. Well, I think, I mean, one of the, well, the other things is that the hor horror genre has shrunk. If you think about sort of the... the, the, the the peak of horror when you had you know, um, James Herbert, you know, Stephen, know, Dennis, King. Stephen King, Dennis Wheatley, and, and now it's, it's, it's very, very niche. But that's because all the horror writers have moved into crime, mm. and, and crime has kind of absorbed that, that nastiness and the fear and, 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 and the gore and stuff. Um, so I think maybe I'm sort of unconsciously, subconsciously influenced by you know, the likes of James Herbert probably more what, than... What do you say to those readers who say it's a shame that the crime genre has been hijacked by horror now? Well, I don't think it has been hijacked because there's still, you know, there's still Agatha Raisin. Yes. Uh, you know, there's, <laughs> the there's, cosies there's, are still there. The right? cosies <laughs> are still there. I write cat mysteries. I mean, there's a, there's a recurrent cat in these. Yes. Uh, uh, so, um, yeah, I, I think there's a, there's a niche. There's obviously people like that. They like 
reading about horrible things happening and then hopefully good triumphing over evil in the end. Um, and, but they're just the crime fiction seems to have absorbed that. I don't think horror took it over. I think it was the other way around. Mm. What about the fact that, although you've already said that you're not entirely a Scottish writer, mm. that a lot of the Scottish writers like Val McDermott and Ian Rankin are quite political. Mm. Uh, Scottish crime writers tend to be quite political. Do you feel that's an element of your work? I don't, I don't think so as much. I've not, I don't consciously put it in. I, and Tony McLean, obviously, he's from a very different strata of society to, to, to John Rebus. Mm. Um, he's an educated man. He's an educated man. He's, he's sent away to public school. Um, he's independently wealthy. Um, yeah, so he does have a, a very different mindset. And there, there, I mean, there is politics in there, but it tends to be the small scale sort of within politics within the police force and, 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 and that sort of thing. Mm. But it, it is true that the, the, you know, the, the Scots are a very political nation. Mm. You just have to look at the independence campaign. And, so will Tony be becoming involved in the independence campaign if it starts again? Well, if we have another one, he might, he might make a sort of, oh, God, no, here we go again, <laughs> remark. It's very difficult, though, to, to sort of, because when I was writing, you know, the book that I was writing um, in the run-up to the independence campaign didn't come out until after it. So I, I couldn't, you know, do I second guess what the result's going to be, or do I just kind of vaguely ignore it? Fudge it. Uh, fudge it. And I, I'm, I'm a fudger every time. <laughs> So how do you feel to keep up with the Scottish theme that in Bloody Scotland, which is a very successful crime mm. festival now, and throughout the UK, tart noir is an identifiable genre. Are you happy to be bracketed with that? I, I, in as much as, you know, it's, there's always that, that sort of marketing thing. I, I, I do feel, you know, maybe I'm, I'm a bit of a pretender to tart noir because, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, a naturalised Scot, as it were. Uh, but it's, it's, a t it's a label. Um, I'm not entirely sure what it actually means because there's so many different books which get labelled under Tartan Noir. So when you're in, going to a pub in Fife, with your accent, do they assume you're English or do they all know you are? You have a reason to be there. I, I think the funniest thing was when my, when my father came to Fife, because my father um, was originally from much further north, east of Ross, but like me, he had, has, a, has a fairly neutral English, had a fairly neutral English accent. He moved to Fife about 30 years ago, so we didn't always farm there. Um, and everyone thought, they, they all called him a white settler, which is what the locals would call uh, incomers from England, until it was pointed out that actually he was born in Edinburgh and, and, and <laughs> raised in Tain. Uh, and they all looked a little bit, a bit stupid after that. But actually, Fife is quite well, we've got St Andrews nearby, which is yes. obviously university towns tend to be. So it's not it's not a parochial place. It's, it can it can be, um, particularly in the sort of agricultural community, can be a little bit. You know, everyone's related to everybody else, um, but it's no, it's 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 not too bad. And we're we're half an hour from Dundee, half an hour from Perth, an hour from Edinburgh. So it's actually very cosmopolitan. You're not quite in the back of the beyond. Not, 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 not totally, no. <laughs> so with the Book of Souls, I noticed that again, the book was fairly gruesome. Mm. Ten victims in ten years was one of the themes. Yeah. Did you start to feel by the time of that book, I've got to up the ante? Um, I'm not sure. I, I do worry sometimes about the body counts. <laughs> uh, I, I, I remember when I was writing Natural Causes and, and counting the number of people murdered in it. And I went and dug up this, this Scottish crime statistics for murders in Edinburgh. And, and that year, there were, the, the, throughout the whole of that year, there were four murders and five were solved because they solved one from the previous year. <laughs> and, that, and they were all basically domestic violence cases that had gotten, you know, gone too far. Uh, and, and there I had half a dozen bankers and lawyers mm. being brutally slain. Isn't uh, that the problem, though, that most of real yeah. crime is fairly banal? Um, it won't make, it, an, it won't make an interesting novel. No, it, and it doesn't. And, 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 and you know, who would ever move to Midsummer? <laughs> that's quite. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, that's uh, t the book of Soul is, is the one in which Tony's fiance is murdered. Well, she's murdered ten years before the book of Souls right. opens. But obviously, there's flashbacks to to him finding her body and the trial and all this sort of stuff. And, and, and but it it actually happens ten years on from that. Uh, Were you worried in that book about? second book syndrome, you'd had a highly successful first book, which was successful electronically. Well, the thing is, it wasn't 
I'd written the Book of Souls long before Natural Causes mm -hmm. became successful, because I wrote Natural Causes, was shortlisted for the debut It wasn't decade. really a second book at all. It was, <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, the, the, one, the one that I wrote once the success had started is the third one, The Hangman's Song. So yes, th that was more like a, a, I've got to really, you know, I've got to up the ante on this one. This has got to be good. And that was, that was tricky to write. Do you hang out with your fellow crime writers like Stuart Neville and Stuart McBride, worrying about how each new book will be received, or are you laid back about such things? I think we're all fairly laid back. I mean, if you, if, it's a funny thing about crime fiction authors, is that as a bunch of people, they tend to be quite laid back and, and nice and just... And fairly collegiate. Yeah, and we, yeah, we all meet up at, at Crime Fest and Harrogate and Bloody Scotland and have a few drinks in the bar and chat about this, that and the other. Um, you go to science fiction conventions and fantasy conventions, and it's, it's a slightly different, there's a, more of a sort of cliqueiness um, so going on. Would you say the, the famous Gore Vidal remark about success, it's not enough that I succeed, one of my friends must fail? That's not true of a crime fiction. There's always a few people who view the world that way, but generally speaking, you know, no, I, I, the, I, the crime writers that I know genuinely enjoy their their friend's success and, 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 and you know, people are, are really, really sort of positive. I mean, I was, I was going to, to Harrogate for probably five years before I was actually published. So I knew a lot of people through Stuart and meeting, meeting other writers. And, and, and then, you know, I turn up with my self-published book suddenly having done really well and everyone's coming up, patting me on the back, saying, well, that's brilliant. How did you do it? What's the secret of your success? And, uh, and really, really supportive. So. You're absolutely right. My experience of science fiction is that it is more cliquey and mm. more, uh, but maybe mm. we've met the wrong science fiction. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe. So by the time of the Hangman's song, book three, you have the male victim. So mm. has it been an issue for you about the number of women who die in crime fiction on the screen and on the page? I think I'm becoming more, more aware, because I mean, when I first wrote, started writing the books, it was just, I fell into all the cliches, basically. Uh, and you know, you 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 murdered Tony McLean's wife, a uh, fiance, to give Tony McLean agency. I mean, that's not really treating her terribly well. Uh, so I was becoming more. It makes it, sense. It makes sense, <laughs> yes. Um, but I, I was becoming more aware of, of that and, and and thinking, well, you know, let's let's swap it round a bit, um, and and actually concentrate more on the victims as well, um, give them lives of their own. Because and think it's a book that deals with trafficking too. Yes, that's kind of a subplot which ties in, um, and yeah, and I turned that on its head as well because I thought you know, trafficking um, Eastern European girls in to be prostitutes on the streets of Edinburgh. Why don't we have them going the other way and see what's and then and then they've got to try and work out what's going on there. Mm. And there's a nice little twist in that. Have you ever had editorial, or well, let's not say interference, let's say input, where James, I think you should play this down, or this really is a bit too gruesome. The only, the only editorial input was with that f opening chapter book. of Natural Causes. Mm. Um, and generally speaking, uh, my editor's quite, quite hands off uh, in that respect. I mean, he gives me really good feedback and he'll tell me where, where the writing's not working or where the plot's not working. But it's never like, oh no, you can't do, you, you're killing too many people or you, you, know, you can't so show guts on the page or whatever. Um, which I think I'm doing less of anyway. I mm. think originally I was writing very much in the vein of. You know, Stuart was writing these gruesome stories, so I was trying to outgore him, <laughs> and it was kind of a lads thing, almost. So, in fact, when your editor says to you, "This isn't quite working," are you biddable, or, oh, yes. or do you throw I, a prima donna pissy fit and say, "Sorry"? I, no, no. I, I having uh, having spent the thick end of twenty years writing stories because I love writing, trying to get published because I would love to be published, and not getting anywhere, not really ever getting very much feedback either. Um, I, I take any and all advice in the spirit it's intended. Mm. I don't always, you know, do what he what he suggests, but but I you know I'm quite you happy. Listen. I listen, and and, and and he's usually right. So uh, about the time of dead men's bones, you're dealing with a world of power and privilege. Mm. Now you're a, a farmer, which has a certain prestige. Yeah. <laughs> do you know that world of power and privilege? Not really, no. Um, I, but it's. It's, it's easy to make up, basically. <laughs> um, that's because not many people do know that world of power and privilege. It's all, um, it's all sort of shadowy connections, old school tie sort of thing. Um, and 
it's the, the story behind that was really more reintroducing a character from a, a story a long, I wrote a long time ago um, who was effectively the, the living personification of the devil mm -hmm. um, wandering around um, causing mayhem and, and Tony McLean has to face up to them. I think one of the Hammer films had the personification of the devil as both Dracula, who's also a property developer. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm quite um, cruel to property developers in, in, in this one, in Prayer for the Dead. And I think that's probably because um, I'm building a house at the moment and some of the builders are, you know, mucking me around. So I put them in my books and, and kill them horribly. <laughs> and I, I think that's one of the reasons why crime writers, you know, going back to what we said earlier, why crime writers are so nice and well adjusted is because all the frustrations in life we get out on the page. Mm. So don't be, don't be cruel to a crime writer because they will put you in a novel and kill them. Uh, I, I, going back to this idea of you being a, um, a farmer, mm. but sitting there in your salmon pink jacket, you're not exactly a horny handed son of toil, are you really? Well, uh, my hands aren't covered in sheep shit today. <laughs> I'll, I'll sheep feces today. <laughs> sheep feces. Uh, <laughs> But, um, well, I mean, we, we sheared the sheep the day before, day before yesterday, just before I came down. So, I mean, I do wear overalls and get my hands dirty. Um, but then I have to put on this, this yeah. costume, as it were. So your secret identity is the, is the crime writer. This is your Batman... Uh, this, this is my, the, yeah, Batman to the... To the and to somebody the actually draw a parallel between Batman and Tony McLean. What yes. was that parallel they drew? Well, I mean, it's, it's an interesting one, because she said to me... Um, you know, he's he's orphaned at a young age. He's 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 wealthy. He fights crime. You know, he's but he's driven by the tragedies of his past to to fight crime rather than just being a policeman because it's a job. Uh, you know, he's raised by a, a an older sort of older figure, um, and he lives in the old family home. Um, he doesn't yet wear a cape, and, and he doesn't have any friends called Robin. But but. But she said to me, you know, you must have had this comparison made loads of times, and this was only yesterday. Uh, and I said, no, no one's ever mentioned it. So and it wasn't in your mind at no, all? No, never occurred This is a revelation to you. Absolutely. <laughs> and it's, it, it's kind of, there's, there's only, as you say, there's only so many stories. Mm. And, and if you've got an orphaned child, then you know, Batman is one of the famous orphans, <laughs> yes, as it were. So coming up to Prayer for the Dead, so is it now routine for you doing promotion for each book, is it the same each time, or is it subtly different? There's a few things which are, are, are fairly similar, because I'm, I'm very lucky. Where I live, there's um, half a dozen um, Waterstones within sort of half an hour's drive, and there's a, there's a Toppings independent bookshop in St Andrews now as well. And I do a kind of little routine around all of them, uh, and, and I know all the booksellers there, and so I always pop in and sign stock. And, 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 they and you go in and put your book face forward in all the displays. They do it for me. They do it for it's you. great. I've got them really well trained. <laughs> uh, and, and we'll do evening events and things like that. Um, and I think there's, there's, there's more of sort of doing interviews things now than there were originally. Mm. But, uh, Are you happy to do that? I love it. Some authors don't like it. I, at the moment, I love it. I think if it, if it gets tiresome, I, you know, you know, I, I, again, I go back to this... 20 years it's taken me to get published, so I'm going to make the most of it. <laughs> Lee Child now says that he won't do things where he just has to talk about Jack Reacher. Mm. He's tired of talking about Jack Reacher. Do you, can you see the day when you're tired of talking about Tony McLean? Probably, yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, how many Jack Reacher books are there <laughs> now? I've got a way to go yet. <laughs> you have got a way to go. So there's no um, 10 book notion in your mind for Tony? I don't think so, no. Um, I mean, I will eventually probably run out of ideas, and I might not be producing them as quickly. Uh, but there's, I've got loads of other books. I mean, I, I'm doing the, the fantasy books as well, and mm. I've got some, some others, uh, other, other plans for other stories on the back burner. So. What about the new phrase that we now call domestic noir, but it's the standalone novel, psychological crime, in which ordinary people's lives are destroyed by? Is there one of those in your, um, in your future? Not immediately, no. <laughs> I'm kind of stuck doing these at the moment. <laughs> Uh, I, I, had, I, did, I had written a, a book before, before all these um, got picked up by Penguin. It was the book that actually my agent took me on for, which has been kind of overtaken by all the Tony McLean books, uh, which is just a, it's a standalone, it's a one-off thriller about a, a, you know, a man who's just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, I don't know whether that will ever see the light of day now, but mm. uh, uh, it needs rewriting. It's, uh, 
and I haven't got time to rewrite <laughs> it. Well, I'm taking home this copy of F of the Dead. James, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.